I kind of leapt into it because I'm in a, a period of my life where I'm really interested in experimenting. I'm interested in growing. I made one other documentary, which was called Made in America about Jay-Z and this music festival he was, he was curating in Philadelphia. And I had a really good creative experience. And so when this prospect was brought to me, I just sort of, I just leapt on it. I knew it would be a fascinating story to work on. Um, and I, I felt I'd grow creatively doing it, you know? And then when it, when it, when word got out there, I was working on it. It just was, it was, it was all over the place. And I began to feel this pressure and wonder whether it was brave or stupid. I think one of the things that's quite interesting about watching the documentary is the amount of original footage you've got from the time and also, crucially, the sounds and the recordings. How did you go about finding all of that content? Well, that content was largely the reason that the people at Apple and that the band wanted, wanted to make a movie because there, there was new footage. It would extend a lot of the live performances. There were these uh, bootleg soundboards that had been discovered and Giles Martin the engineer felt like he could take it and digitize it and enhance it and give audiences a chance to sort of rediscover what a great, great live band they were. So that was the impetus for even making the movie. I love music and that was, you know, important to understand that, that we had as an asset, but I was interested in the human story. So um, my sort of pitch back to, um, you know, Olivia and Yoko and, and Ringo and Sir Paul was, I want to tell the story of the, of the journey. I think it's brilliant you only want to do the touring years because it's an adventure story. It's like a survival story. Look what you went through. And as I did more and more research, I felt that that was something really worth identifying. And there were those really intimate moments uh, on the film. I always remember that one of um, George Harrison dropping his ash from his cigarette on John Lennon's head well, during the interview. Those are, they, were, they were hilarious. Look, they were, the, these guys were on another level in so many different ways. They were, they were fast. They were funny. These are smart people. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were creative, obviously. Um, they had a kind of a, and this is probably the biggest discovery, discovery for me, is a kind of a um, personal... Um, and artistic integrity that really guided them. I mean, when you think about how much money they left on the table when they came into Studio Two here and devoted themselves to being, uh, taking their work to this next artistic level instead of being out there on the road, you know, selling tickets, um, it's staggering. And they never thought twice about it. I mean, it was just, to them, it was, um, you know, it was where their lives and needed to go. But the other thing that you touched upon that was quite interesting was the political context, particularly in the um, civil rights movement. Yeah. I, as a viewer, wasn't aware, for example, that they refused to, pay, to play in front of audience, audiences that were segregated. Well, I, as a director, was not aware of the stand they'd taken um, uh, re regarding segregation in, 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 the, in the South, in the U.S. And, and I, can, I can tell you, as an American who was old enough to know what was going on, what a powerful stand that actually was. Now, I wasn't that aware of it at that time. Uh, I, I remembered them being more vocal about Vietnam a little bit later. But again, this is sort of just in their DNA. It, it, it wasn't a big deal to them. I mean, it, it was just um, logical to them. One thing, here's right, here's wrong. Let's do the right thing. And, uh, and, and they, they let those principles guide them. And um, they, had, they had good intuition. Good, good stock. If I may, I'm going to ask you a little bit about contemporary politics um, as well. You were quite a vocal supporter of Barack Obama. Are you also behind Hillary Clinton's campaign? I, I am, yes. Yeah, I definitely think she's a fantastic uh, um, candidate. Her resume is spectacular. And uh, so I'm, I'm, a, yeah, I'm a supporter. That's, that's, where I, that's, where, that's where my vote's going. And what's, what do you make of the prospect of a Donald Trump presidency? Um, you know, I, um, to, to be honest, I, I, don't, I don't think he's a professional. I don't think he's, I, I, I think he's, he's a, I, I know him a little bit. You know, he's a remarkably um, successful in, in one area, mostly, mostly branding, you know. And he's applying a lot of what he's, what he's, what he's learned. But I, I don't, I, there's not evidence that that equals leadership and, and, and sort of the global knowledge base to be able to, 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 to make great decisions uh, of which, you know, uh, any, any, any leader of a nation must, must deal with, you know, uh, minute to minute. So, uh, you know, to me, it, you, you look at the resumes 
and and um, you know you, you you go with the person uh, who who kind of has the degree. <laughs> if I, I think I'd rather go to the doctor who has the degree on the wall. So quite an easy choice for you then. Yeah, very easy.